Welcome everyone to our UK beef management webinar series. Uh, we're getting started back. We've been on hiatus for a, a few months now, but uh, for the next three months, we'll be coming to you every Tuesday evening, uh, the second Tuesday of uh, of every month uh, here through February anyway. And so uh, we do welcome you tonight. We're going to do uh, something that those of you that have been with us in the past, we do on occasion, and that's what we call our shoot the bull session. Uh, we're going to each go around and, and give a little timely topic. Uh, and then uh, at the end or during this, anytime, if you have a question, just put it in the chat, if you would, uh, and we'll get to those questions that you guys have as well. Um, and with that, uh, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Darrell Bullock, uh, one of the beef specialists uh, here at in housed in Lexington. Uh, my area is genetics. Um, and so I'm going to start off and, and I'm going to introduce uh, each of the other folks uh, and then we'll we'll turn it over to them. And um, and like I said, if you have any questions or comments, you can put those in the chat. Uh Dr. Anderson, you're first up on, on mine, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Les Anderson. He's our repro fizz guy, um, and I'm going to, uh, I guess, I, I'm going to unshare my screen, Les, and then you should be able to take it. There you go. Good job. Yeah, I should I should have it up. Uh, Les Anderson, uh, reproductive specialist, um, University of Kentucky, housed out of Lexington. Uh, bear with me. I've got the end of a cold, I'm hoping. Um, and so my voice is going to be a little bit raspy tonight. Um, not not a lot uh, as far as timely topics uh, for uh, um, reproduction right now. Um, we're, if you're a spring calving herd uh, and you have not yet determined pregnancy in your herd, I would absolutely advise you to get that done. We have multiple methods of getting pregnancy determined in our in our cattle. Uh, the first is the uh, time uh, proven and tested rectal palpation. Uh, just contact your local uh, veterinarian, your herd veterinarian, um, and schedule a, a time that they can come in and, and get a pregnancy determination for you. Uh, of course, uh, uh, determining conception date is, is pretty handy when it comes to uh, um, planning for your calving, but if, you, if you're a spring calver and you're just now getting pregnancy determined, being very accurate on, on the conception date would be difficult. Uh, another method would be ultrasonography. And then finally, uh, the third method is blood sampling. You can either do a blood sampling uh, sample and send it to uh, the UK Diagnostic Lab for pregnancy determination, or um, there are other companies uh, there's also a shoot side uh, blood test available now, um, but we're getting ready to enter our winter feeding period. I'm not going to talk at all about nutrition, but, you know, wouldn't be too bad a time to figure out how to save on your feed bill by getting rid of uh, 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 your non-productive cows. Just uh, probably d uh, dumping in just a little bit into, into Dr. Lemcooler and Van Valen stuff, but Absolutely advise you to monitor body condition score and feed according, accordingly. Um, all I'm going to do is uh, I, want, I want you to write it down because it's really not a record if we don't write it down and have a report. Identify those cows that are a little bit thin, and now is the absolute best time to add weight to your uh, to those uh, second period uh, or early third period pregnant cows. You can you can get that weight on them pretty economically. Remember, our goal is to have them calve at minimum a body condition score of five, okay? And so that's just enough fat that you can't see the ribs. They have a little bit of fat covering over the tail head, over the hooks, a little bit over, over the, the, the uh, spine. And so they're, they're smooth but not, not blotchy in appearance. Um, and, and really that's ideal for, for the cows to get them uh, to rebreed quickly and to have uh, maximum reproductive efficiency is for them to calve at a body condition score five or greater. And now is the ideal time to uh, to get those corrections made. And then the last thing for spring calving herds, uh, you're you're developing your heifers for for replacement. 
You want to monitor their growth to make sure that they're developing adequately. Typically, we need them to gain one and a half to one and three quarters pounds a day to reach their target weight uh, about 30 days before the uh, onset of the breeding season. And so just take a get a weight on them, make sure that they're 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 gaining uh, appropriately so that they'll be able to hit their target weight on their target date. If you're a fall calving herd, let me see here, get this thing to advance. <clears throat> really, uh, you've, you've more than likely either about a month into the breeding season or maybe a week to 10 days, um, make sure you're watching your bulls. I just had a situation like this this last summer a pop up where <clears throat> the bull had been with cows for quite a while. They had they very busy people. They were multiple different areas uh, in their diverse farming operation. Um, they got to noticing that the bull continued to serve as cows, and it ended up being that the bull had gone infertile. Um, and, you know, they were able to salvage it by some rapid um, kind of timely bull purchases and, and got a little lucky, just to be honest about it. But the main the main point is is that they were able to they were watching the bulls they were paying attention they noticed a little bit uh, you know higher return rate than they were expecting and so uh, they were able to get in and get that uh, get that taken care of um, just like your spring calving cows monitor body condition score on your your fall calving cows we can't afford to have them losing a drastic amount of weight right now. Um, Conception rate can change by as much as 20%. And so if that takes us from 70% to 50%, that it that doubles the length of time it need that you need to get them uh, more than 90% of them bred. And so we need to make sure that our cows are at least maintaining weight here. And um, that's usually uh, pretty easy to do this time of year with fall calving cows, but Definitely, we need to, to, to monitor that and make sure our cows are continuing to at least maintain weight. And with that, Dr. Bullock, that's got the uh, repro updates taken care of. Okay. Uh, Les, uh, hang on. It just disappeared on me. Um, had a comment. Uh, so, David Hamilton asks, can producers submit to the diagnostic lab directly or only through the vet? I'm pretty sure you can submit pregnancy diagnosis directly. Um, but uh, I'm 99% I'm sure on that, but I will double check. Uh, Dr. Anderson, I think there is a difference between the UK diagnostic lab and the Breathit lab in Hopkinsville. I believe Hopkinsville, you may need your vet for that one. Um, but UK, I think they can submit on their own. I hope I don't have that backwards, but then the other one would be um, dependable livestock testing there in the Smith's Grove area. That could be. Yeah. I, I, I highly recommend uh, Sandy there at dependable livestock there at, uh, at Smith's Grove. They do a phenomenal job. A lot of great customer service. Um Absolutely recommend uh, using them. And uh, too bad we don't have Dr. Arnold on tonight. She has another webinar that she's given for vets and couldn't join us. But um, I, we can try and find that out and, and shoot out an, an email on it, too. So, all right. Appreciate it, Dr. Anderson. Any other questions, just uh, type them in if you guys would. Um, Next up on our list for me is uh, Dr. Jeff Limcooler. So Dr. Limcooler is one of our nutrition guys, as most of you know. And so, uh, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. And hopefully you can see my slides there. Um, are they? Oh, hold on. That's swapped over just so that I thought I had that right. <laughs> we can see, see that now? There you go. That's the perfect one. All right. Thank you, guys. And so, uh, again, I just want to hit on a few things, just like Dr. Anderson did. We'll start off with uh, thinking about groups of cows. So fall calvers, um, they're coming off or maybe some late calvers are just coming into the highest nutrient requirement in their annual cycle. And that coincides with 
peak milk production. So peak milk production is going to occur six to eight weeks after calving. So if you scroll back and you think we're at the first of December, then, um, you know, those October cows are going to be coming uh, into peak and or September cows would just be coming off a of peak. So be be thinking about that nutritional needs on those cows. Um, as, as we think about trying to, uh, again, step into Dr. Anderson world, uh, optimize fertility, if we can increase that plane and nutrition, uh, right, you know, a couple of weeks pre-breeding here and, and then through the about the f- oh, three, four weeks after we turn bulls in, it's going to give those cows a little higher plane nutrition, both energy and protein and increase your odds of getting those cows to settle early in that breeding cycle as they're coming off that high plane of nutritional demand and also dealing with some up and down uh, weather here. Uh, the calves, don't forget about the calves. You know, they're going to be relying more and more on uh, the forage that you provide them uh, from this point to weaning. Uh, this really coincides with the lactation curve. Uh, thinking about those cows now have hit peak and are going to start dropping in milk production from now through the spring. So we've got uh, increased uh, calf size, hopefully. And so those calves are are going to be bigger. Maintenance requirements are going to be higher at the same time milk production is going down. So if you want to keep those calves gaining, we need to make sure that we uh, provide them with a high quality forage. So you might consider uh, creep feeding a higher quality hay where uh, those cows may not need that higher quality hay, but you can set up creep gates, even feed hay that way. You can also consider creep feeding a uh, grain supplement to increase the plane and nutrition for that calf to be able to meet that genetic potential for gain. So those are some things on the fall calvers, spring calvers. Uh, those cows are, are probably at their lowest nutritional demand right now. That's that mid gestation dry cow. She's not lactating. The fetus is relatively small, so it's not a huge drain on her from a nutritional standpoint. That said, however, these cows will be entering that last trimester relatively soon. And as they go into that last trimester, we're also going to be dealing with potentially cold and weather and maybe some mud. Let's hope not, but maybe some mud. But that last trimester is when the vast majority of that fetal development occurs. You also have to think about mammary gland development and colostrum production. And so we want to make sure that we don't short our cows in that last trimester. Some of the, you know, the research that's been done over the last couple of decades on fetal programming indicates this last trimester can be pretty important from a nutritional standpoint to set these calves up for the rest of their lives and optimizing productivity. I wanted to touch base real quickly and, and not jump into Dr. Burdine's area too much here, but I want to tie this back into some feed prices. Uh, there is a little bit of a relief if we look back to corn prices last year. You know, last year we were uh, average around 694. This year looks like we're going to be around 575. So if we look at corn at $1.20 a bushel lower this year, that's about a 40, $45 per ton decrease in feedstuffs. And so I just mentioned this because corn prices uh, are directly tri- tied into and, and kind of drive our co-product feeds and, and the prices we see on those. And just to kind of validate that, I pulled up uh, this past month's USDA feed report here for you. And the blue arrows, I've, I've just kind of pulled out some states here for distillers grains as an option to, to look at. But you can see Illinois. Uh, average is about 210. A year ago, we were about 232. You jump down there to Iowa, it's about 195. A year ago, it was about 222. So we're seeing about a $30 difference, uh, 20 to $30 difference in distiller's grain prices. You jump down to corn gluten feed in central U.S., uh, 178. You might as well call that 180 versus a year ago, we were about 215. So again, we're seeing that $35, $40 difference uh, in co-product prices, which, you know, I think Dr. Burdine would agree is directly driven by what our commodity grain prices like corn and soybean mill are doing. So I put that out there simply to let you all kind of remember, um, don't pull those purse strings back too tight. Uh, Calf prices are good. Granted, they've softened a little bit. Um, but calf prices are still relatively good. And so you want to make sure that we get these cows the best chance they can to get you uh, a calf on the ground that's going to be healthy, get up 
and, and get nursing quickly, get good colostrum, and really reduce the potential to develop uh, scours, respiratory disease throughout the summer, et cetera. So uh, don't don't neglect the nutrition right now just because you think um, calf prices have softened a little bit. There's still a little bit more margin in there this year than there was a year ago. So with that, Dr. Bullock, I'm going to stop sharing and let you turn it on over to the next person. Okay. I got a quick question for you, Dr. Lim Cooler, if you don't mind. Um, so it, 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 there's been some pretty dry areas of the state this year, and some people probably got into their hay resources a, a little early. Um any strategies for them if if it looks like they're going to have to buy some supplemental feed at some point in time on on you know whether that's better to feed that earlier or later any any recommendations on that so just try to match that up with the the stage of production on our cows that's a good question so thinking about these fall calvers right now that are coming off of peak and then breeding season they have a higher nutritional need now. So now would be the time to think about uh, swapping in some grain or, or co-product feeds. I'd like to see you use a co-product feed that's low in starch, you know, a, a blend of, of corn gluten, soy hulls or distillers and corn or a three-way blend, all those work. Um, you can you can see what's going to be cheaper for you in your area. We see some varying prices in feed stuffs, but dry cows that are fall uh, spring, um, kind of calvers that were weaned back in the fall, you know, they're at the lowest nutritional needs. So I would be thinking about ramping them up on the nutritional plane as they enter that trimester. But all that said, uh, we can, we can limit feed cows and replace hay with grain and um, manage those cows to meet their nutritional needs with greater grain intake and less hay intake. My only caution is, is that fences will be tested and trees will have bark eaten off of them and some of those things that um, you just need to be mindful of when you start replacing grain and limiting hay intake. You're meeting nutritional needs of cows, but that rumen has stretch sensors on it and it's telling the cow, eat, eat, eat. And if there's nothing there for her to eat, she's going to try and find something to eat. All right. Good advice. Thank you, sir. Um, well, since we're on the topic of uh, forages and all, I think uh, we'll skip over to Dr. Ray Smith, uh, one of our forage specialists. I appreciate Ray helping us out tonight. And uh, so, Ray, I'm going to turn it over to you. Glad to be here. Um, Dare, if you could put up your title slide that had the cows and the yep. grass in it. We often talk about having stockpiled tall fescue to graze this time of year. Um, I know a lot of people don't have very much based on just the dry fall. If you have stockpiled fescue, obviously that's useful to graze. Some of you may have noticed issues with your animals if they were grazing fescue in the last month, uh, meaning maybe potential lameness, maybe a little bit unthriftiness uh, because ergovalin levels were quite high. Um, fescue starting back growth after a long dry period often has higher levels of that toxin, that ergovalin. Fortunately, the the last couple of weeks of, of colder of cold temperatures and, and up and down temperatures, um, we've been monitoring that ergovalin weekly and it and it is having a significant drop now. So we're getting into a period that the stockpiled fescue um, should not create any issues for your animals. One of the best ways, as we've talked about, um, Jimmy and Chris and I have talked about in, in many times, to take care of fescue issues is by adding clover to your pasture. You get added quality, protein, free nitrogen. Um, you dilute fescue. Um, and then red clover has the additional advantage of actually dilating the blood vessels that have been constricted from fescue. So it's a little early to frost seed right now. So I, I'm telling you to be thinking about it and be preparing for it. And a couple of things to prepare. One, if you've got a lot of weeds in that field and you say, I don't know whether to use a herbicide or not. When we have temperatures that are in the 50s and, and 
just below freezing or not below freezing at night, like we kind of almost have this week in some places in the state, you can still go out and, and spray a herbicide to kill weeds. Um, you have a waiting period before after you spray before you frost seed. But if you're frost seeding in mid-February, then something like a 2,4-D product or 2,4-D dicamba, you'd be okay. Um, you've got about a month to two months of wait with that 2,4-D dicamba. Now, if you if you've used this fall or you're thinking about using something like Duracore Grazon Next, they have a long residual. So if you've used that, there's no point frost seeding clover. It's not going to come up. So weed control is one thing, but you can't control weeds and then frost seed clover the next day. Um, so you'd have to be able to get a window in to knock the weeds out now. Now is the time to lime and fertilize. Let that lime be working the soil, increasing the pH, getting the fertility up so the clover is going to establish better. Then before you frost seed, and again, you're shooting for mid-February. Um, it could be even early February with the with the early springs that we've had um, the last few years or some of the last few years. Just make sure you graze close before you frost seed. And our standard recommendation still fits. One to two pounds of a Ladino white clover or intermediate type white clover and six to eight pounds of red clover. Now, if you're looking at the price of clover seed and you say you get a bit of sticker shock and you say, well, I'm not going to this year. I know I need to, but it costs too much. I mean, if you only went with one pound of Ladino clover and four to five pounds of red clover, that's still going to be a benefit to you. Um, so get the land ready. Um, lime and fertilize. Be ready for frost seeding. You, we may have some windows for, for weed control if need be. One of the most important things I want to remind you of or mention to you if you if you haven't heard, from every source I've heard, from seed companies, from national experts, um, white and red clover seed is in short supply. In fact, some of the shortest supplies that we've seen in the last number of years, especially the improved varieties. Many of the improved varieties, the seed is expected to run out to be unavailable when we get to late January, early February. So now is a good time to go ahead and line up the seed, whether you're going ahead and buying it or whether you're just lining up with your seed supplier. And in years like this, when seed supplies are short, then the seed you buy in mid-February, I could almost guarantee it's going to be non-adapted seed. It might be a variety that you've never heard of, maybe variety not stated or just common seed that's probably coming from Western Canada that's only going to live a year. Um, could be white clover that's grown down in Paraguay or Uruguay and it's not going to survive our winters. So so go ahead and get that seed lined up. We've just published our variety test reports on clover in the summary report. So if you Google KY forages, once you get to the forage website, look under variety test, and uh, probably the easiest thing is just click on that summary report. Go to the red clover, go to the white clover um, summary pages, and look at the varieties that have done best over years. If you want more detail, you kind of want to see what the actual yields were, then we've got the red and white clover report as well. In fact, we've even started testing the annual espadisa, so we've got a little bit of that in that red and white clover report. And one last thing, we've had low hay supplies. We've had some issues with, with spring hay production. Fertilizer prices are high, but remember, if you're growing hay and you're trying to get production, you're going to need to fertilize. Um, particularly putting nitrogen down at spring green up. So I, I know it, it's expensive to buy the nitrogen, but at green up, um, put out the nitrogen. If if you normally put out 80 or 90 pounds per acre of nitrogen um, and, and you say you can't afford that, then then even 50 pounds, um, you know, that, that'd be about a little over 100 pounds of urea um, are, is going to benefit that hay production. I think I'll leave it at that and, and be ready for questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Bullock. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We actually have a question from Tracy Pritchard who asked, when is a good time to aerate poor pasture and how beneficial is it? So the research that's been done on aerating is, is very mixed. Um, they did an extensive study in Tennessee several years ago and they saw some initial just kind of appearance of a quicker green up but when they looked at actual yield and production there was no benefit to the aeration if you if you are going to aerate 
in essence, maybe you've got a, a really a feeding area. It's really hard packed and, and you're trying to loosen up. The key is to aerate when the soil is not wet, when the soil is, is dry, because when the soil is wet, those spike type aerators, they're actually causing more compaction than they're helping. So if you're going to do it, make sure the soil is wet or just damp. I mean, I'm sorry, the soil is dry or just damp. Um, but overall, I don't recommend aeration as, as a benefit. To get a good grass stand, to get good clover, those roots are going to do more than, than anything else. All right, good deal. Um, actually, Dr. Anderson shot me a question, so I'm going to ask it. Has USDA validated uh, vasodilation in standing red clover? Most data I've seen is dried leaves mixed with mineral. Yes, the early work that they were doing that Glenn Aiken started was with, with grazing red clover. And when when they had a, a fourth to a third red clover in that fescue pasture, um, if cattle that were grazing toxic fescue at and had vasoconstriction 50% of the normal size of their blood vessels, they had dilated to to um 90% of normal. Just um after just one week. So that was with, with standing red clover. They're doing a lot of work trying to do it with mixing in the mineral because obviously that would be convenient and that would work whether your red clover was growing in the field or not. Excellent. Yeah, I saw a, a presentation out at uh, out at Beef Bash this year on it and it's, it's pretty impressive. It's, uh, I think, a lot of potential there. All right. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And uh, and I think you're going to stay with us. So if anybody has any other questions, they can type them in or we can get those at the end. Um, and now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Kenny Burdine, our ag economist and marketing guru. He's going to tell you guys just how much money you're going to make this year. So we always look forward to that, Kenny. You bring in sharing the good news this time of year. Good deal. Thanks. Do you need to share screen or do yeah. you have it? Okay. Yeah, uh, if you'll drop that for me, I'm going to. Yep. I brought a few slides to show. So there is more good news, I guess, than usual to talk about. And I'll, I'll roll through some things. But I want to start with something, I guess, that kind of was a backdrop for what Jeff talked about. And I'm going to hit head on what's happened the last few months. But the big picture fundamentals haven't changed that much. I talked a lot about cow numbers over the last, you know, last year or two. And yeah, we're, you know, cow numbers are down big time. We're, we're down at about a 60, 61 year low. The other thing that I think is important to understand is that 2023 is going to be our first year over year decrease in beef production since 2015. And that's important. Um, the cow herd peaked in 2019. And realistically, what that would mean was you would have thought 2020 would have kind of been our high water mark for beef production. In other words, that 2019 calf crop, you know, gets gets fed and harvested in, in 2020. Obviously, 2020, COVID pushed some that into 2021. And then 2022, we had widespread drought in all of cattle country and killed a lot of females. So bottom line is we kind of drug that out for two more years. So what it really meant was that, that prices kind of stayed depressed for a couple of years longer than they would have otherwise. And that means they're going to kind of run quicker and higher like they did this year. And that that really drove things for the first nine months of the year. Um, there we go. I want to hit head on though what's happened since mid September, and at the risk of sounding a little over dramatic, I, I put on here that the feeder cattle board imploded, and I think that's that's not totally unfair. We're off, I don't know, something like forty five dollars a hundred weight or so from where we were. This is the January contract I'm showing you there on the right. Several things I'll just mention, kind of thinking through what I think what I think happened over the last roughly roughly ninety days now. First of all, I think we've simply gotten a little heated. Um, and that, that's not to say I saw this come by any means. I don't think hardly anybody did. But the August feeder cattle futures contract went off the board at about $250 a pound. At the same time, the you know, the um the corresponding live cattle futures contract for Fed cattle would have been February. That went off the board about a dollar ninety. 
Okay, so in other words, I can think, okay, if I if I've got you know eight weight feeders in August moving at two fifty, and that's what I've got if I'm a feed lot and I place those feeders on feed. I'm gonna they have the expectation of moving fats in February of twenty twenty four at a dollar ninety. Bottom line is with cost of gain estimates where they were, those cattle were going to lose about a hundred bucks a head. So that happens sometimes. You know, we can see that for a while. What it really means is that those cattle that were placed this summer, for them to be profitable, they had to move at higher prices at harvest time than what live cattle futures were suggesting. But I think it just made the market a little bit vulnerable as we moved into fall. That's kind of number one. Um and then we had kind of a string of bearish news. Um, despite, this, despite the fact that the cow was small, the calf crop was small in 2023. We saw September placements up by 6%. About two weeks later, second week in November, USDA raised their beef production forecast by 2% for 2024. And then the October placement number came in higher than a year ago and again all you know both of all of those you know the both those placement numbers for september and october were both kind of surprising in the sense that we we knew this calculated this calf crop was smaller i still maintain that was just a function of timing we had a lot of dry weather i actually think because placements were high in september and october i think as we get into winter december january places i think we'll see them down but it didn't change the fact that that there was an impact there on the marketplace some encouraging news. Um, what I it's it's kind of hard to tell on that chart, but what I pulled for you here, I read this about thirty minutes ago. We've actually closed higher for three straight days, which is encouraging to me. And, and today was interesting because we opened lower and then we found a way to push higher. So we've added about nine bucks or so to that January board over the last three days. So three positive closes back to back: Friday, Monday, and today, Tuesday make me pretty optimistic. We may have kind of hit our bottom here, so I'm encouraged by that. Good news is our calf prices and cattle prices haven't been hit quite as hard. Um, heavy feeders have been hit harder. They've probably borne about two-thirds of it, meaning that, you know, if, if, if the board's been down for January by, you know, 40 to 50 bucks a hundred weight, we've probably bore about two-thirds of that here in Kentucky. Calf prices, honestly, off about 20 cents from summer. And about half of that seasonal anyway, you know, these calves are further from the knife, so they're not going to be hit quite as hard by this kind of stuff. So, you know, the, the good news is it's, it's hit the board harder than local price. But I think it's important just to kind of step back sometimes and think about where we are big picture. And I'll, I'll wrap up with some thoughts here and a couple more slides about um, take home points. But, you know, the truth is we've still got a lot of dry weather in a lot of places. Um, if you look at cow slaughter in 2023 as a, as a as a percentage of beef cow numbers, we're still culling this cow here pretty hard. If you look at the number of heifers on feed, I get this once a quarter. So I, my last estimate was for October 1st. I won't get another one until January. But we've certainly got a lot of heifers on feed right now. Combine that with production costs being higher and interest rates to me are the real kicker. I think we don't talk about enough is that, you know, it's hard to expand when interest rates are eight and nine percent on operating loans and, 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 and on cows. So we're going to see this cow herd get even smaller um, when the numbers come out January 2024. I think we'll be off another, I'm guessing, 600, 700,000 cows, which is significant by all means. I think from a lot of producers perspective, you look at what happened in the second half of 2023 and compared to 2015 and you kind of think, OK, are we looking at a similar story to what we saw back in 2015? And I think the answer is no. Um, by the time we were by the time we were at this point of the year in 2015, we absolutely had signs of beef production was increasing. Beef production was down about 5 percent in 2023 to be down about 4 percent in 2024. So that's different. The other one that I wrote about in Cattle Market Notes a few weeks ago, well, a couple months ago, actually, um, by 2015, we were seeing a lot more competition from other meats. Pork and poultry can always expand quicker. And between 2014 and 2015, we saw a 9% increase in pork production. It's going to be about 2% in 2023. Brewers, by the way, are going to be almost flat down, you know, one to, or sorry, a, a, about half a percent, two percent increase next year. So, we're not going to see near the competition at the meat case that we saw by the time we got to 2015. 
Interest rates were lower in 15. That kind of fueled some expansion. It's much a different story right now. And again, by 2015, we were holding back heifers, and it was clear we were trying to grow this cow herd. And in 2023, these heifers are, are not, not being held at all. So although it's been a tough run here, you know, the supply fundamentals are really very much like they were, frankly, at the start of 2023. And I just say that because I think given that, I think the odds of a turnaround in 2024 are much higher than they were in 2016. In fact, I think we'll, we'll see prices. I, I frankly think this calf market is going to be higher come spring of 2024 than it was in summer of 2023. Now, I can be wrong about that, but that's my best guess looking forward. I want to mention just a couple of things real quick. Um, because the supply fundamentals look good and because, frankly, I can't really in good faith forecast this cow herd growing any sooner than 2025 and maybe longer than that if weather doesn't cooperate. But we should get multiple good years kind of back to back here for cow calf operations. Um, so I think that thinking about how to use that is important. There's something about $3 calves that always get folks excited. And, you know, if, if I'm right about this market come spring, I think we'll see $3 calves again. But I want to make something very clear. I think in the spring of 2024, those $3 calves will weigh about 400 pounds. So somebody may sell some $3 calves for $1,200. Their neighbor may sell some 550 pound calves a couple of months later that sell for 260. And the neighbor pockets over 200 more dollars per calf. And I think that's important to understand. Don't get so focused on price, you lose the big picture. And, um, you know, we're not trying to maximize price. That's just one, one part of that revenue formula. The other thing that I've said, and I understand that there, you know, I, I absolutely think there's not a lot of interest in growing the cow herd right now. But I think it's important to remember that there's things we can do to invest in our cow herds, you know, during good, you know, good calf revenue times besides ad cows. And things like investments in grazing, genetics, and facilities that allow us to sell value-added cattle, weed calves, things like that are usually good investments. They make us more profitable, more efficient going forward. And kind of putting on a finance cap, it's not really my cup of tea, but just kind of thinking about it from a finance perspective. You know, anytime, anything we can do to lower debt and, you know, kind of sets us up for more profitability down the road, understand that in the new entering environment, you know, some of your, you know, some of your older debt that's fixed is probably not an issue. And thinking about avoiding newer higher interest rate debt becomes even more important. And the other thing we don't talk about enough, but, you know, simply just retaining some profits and building up some working capital is really something to think about. You know, working capital can kind of become a seed, a seed fund, if you will, for purchases you need down the road if, if that adjoining piece of property comes for sale. And just think about it this way. You know, every every dollar that I can avoid borrowing at eight and a half percent on operating note, right, that I can fund through working capital is an eight and a half percent return on that money that I've got. So anything we can do to like, you know, utilize some of that revenue to build up some some capital and kind of self-fund some things that we would have to finance ordinarily probably pays a pretty good return. The other thing that I want to make sure we understand or think about for margin operations is I don't think this changes that much from where we've been the last couple of years. Is feed cheaper than a year ago? Yeah, feed cheaper than it was back in the summer. It's still not cheap. And by that, I mean, I can look at that December um, corn futures contract. It's still trading north of five bucks a bushel. So we're still in a fairly high feed price environment. And I'm not talking about this from kind of the feeding perspective like Jeff was talking about. I'm talking about it more from kind of the feedlot perspective. Reason I want to point this out is what drives the value of gain, what drives how much we can make on every pound that we add if we're background or stockers, okay, is essentially what it costs those feed yards to do that same thing. If we can add pounds via pasture, via commodity feeds, via byproduct feeds, anything that we can do, if we can do it cheaper than the feed yards can do it out west, the market's going to adjust and ask us to do that. And it's done that the last several years. I think it'll do it again in 2024. We've got to be opportunistic. Um, I ran a quick backgrounding budget for, for these lenders' conferences I was in the last couple of days. And, you know, there, there's there's still potential to place calves right now on you know, springboard and make this work. But on the same note, I've got to be opportunistic. And when I can get calves bought at the right price, I've got to move. And frankly, I think I need to protect that sale price. So continue to use things like livestock risk protection insurance if contracts are available, look at things like that. But, you know, we're going to see the volatility 
we also have to understand that the same market fundamentals that for the same market fundamentals, the same the same factors that probably drove this market lower than it should have the last few months. We have to be realistic and say that probably also drove the market higher than it should have back in the summer. And we've got to take advantage of some of those things in terms of um, price risk management. So anyway, that would be my my quick summary for where we are now. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Dr. Burdon. Uh, actually, Kenny, I've got a, a question for you. I, you know, I, I get a little bit concerned sometimes when cattle prices uh, are, are in this higher end that we're in now. Um, and, and just curious your thoughts on this. For somebody that has a relatively young herd, so they haven't been just holding on to everything, um, I, I get concerned that that some people they see the high prices and they and they get that you know they they say well I need to expand I need to increase my cow numbers and everything um, is is that a good move at this time because to me it seems like maybe they should be selling those heifers still as long as they're relatively young now taking advantage of these high prices because cows these heifers are keeping back now we don't know where the prices are going to be when they hit uh, on the production side of the thing. What, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So heifers that we, so heifers that we keep this fall, um, you know, are, are two years away from selling their first calves, right? So that's kind of the first thing to think about. Um, do I think we should expand as a general rule? Honestly, I don't. Um, I think there will be producers that will do that, but I think they need to be producers that are fully low cost producers, right? In a lot of cases, I think that we forget sometimes that, we can make more money, right, by simply running the same number of cows, but doing so more efficiently. If I've got a young cow herd right now, I think I'm in the driver's seat, frankly, right? I should have some good productive cows in the next few years when prices are going to be good. So it's not that I'm anti-expansion. I just, I mean, my, my guess would be maybe two out of three operations are probably pushing me overstocked at times anyway. So expanding those operations to me might set them up to be more vulnerable down the road. So unless you're unless you're certain you can do that and not impact costs negatively, then I think looking at some other ways to invest in your cow to be more efficient and lower cost are probably a better way to utilize the prices. I think we're going to enjoy the next couple of years. Thank you, sir. All right, just to kind of keep us on time, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, and uh, we have up next Dr. Katie Van Valen, um, who, unlike the rest of us who are housed up in Lexington, she's in the western part of the state. So, Dr. Van Valen, take it away. Do you need to share your screen? Or you, it's available if you do. Yes. Just All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of follow uh, suit with some of the other themes you've already heard tonight. Um, we are, are right in the, the midst of winter feeding, and, and probably most of us will be for the next couple months. And so um, if we are feeding uh, stored forages, um, I, I see, a, you know, there's always a lot of variation in forage quality um, that we see and and the best way that we have to to understand what type of forage quality we have is is to send that sample out to the lab get the hay tested um so you know what you're working with um i get a, i i talk to folks a lot of times and say i i don't want to get it tested just because i know it's not going to be very good um but it, it is helpful to to know what what you're uh, looking at because keep in mind you know a few percentage point difference on on something like a tdn it is really the difference between that hay uh, meeting or, or not meeting the nutritional needs of, of that female. Um, so um, not too late to, to get that hay tested if we haven't gotten that done already. Um, and one of the things that we can do once we have the hay tested, of course, is make make decisions about what hay that we're, we're feeding to which uh, animals on the operation and when. Uh, we can save that better quality hay for uh, our lactating cows, um, that will be their highest nutrient requirement throughout the year is, is when they're, uh, after they've had that, that calf. And as Dr. Limcooler mentioned, you know, for our, our fall calving cows that, that calved kind of earlier in the fall, their, their requirements are actually starting to come back down now. Um, but for our spring calving herds that are, are getting 
ready to to move into calving in the next couple months think about about holding on to that better quality hay for kind of the end of that that winter feeding season um the the female we probably don't think uh, enough about sometimes is that first calf heifer uh, after she's had her first calf um that period of time between when she's had that first calf and when we are trying to breed her back it is really critical um she has that added requirement of of growth that our mature cows no longer have. Um, and, and so paying a little closer attention to those females in particular uh, in their feeding program um, can really be beneficial for us. Um, Cause you know, we, we always say give or take based on, on cost of production, you know, it takes those, those females five or six years to become profitable. So certainly if we call her because she didn't breed back after her first calf, because she was in poor body condition, that's not, uh, going to be beneficial for us. Um, and then also thinking if we are going to hold on to those weaned calves, uh, maybe um, feed them uh, for uh, 60, 90 days uh, and market them in uh, any kind of a preconditioned program, be thinking about uh, keeping back some some decent quality uh, hay for those particular animals as well, um, because that forage quality also uh, impacts how much of it that they're they're ultimately going to consume and when we think about that weaned calf we're, we're really thinking about uh, trying to get calories in the mouth so as we start kind of thinking about managing what hay supply we have um, you know sometimes we're we're thinking you know you know about feeding that best quality hay this time of year or maybe it's a matter of sitting on it till the end of the season um, but at the end of the day um, numbers are are just numbers and the numbers we get back from the lab are, are really a reflection of that sample that we sent to the lab. Um, and the true, I always tell producers, it doesn't, as a nutritionist, I can, I can formulate a ration for you. I can, I can give you those recommendations, but the cows are the ultimate uh, indicator of how well we're doing uh, with our feeding program. Um, so always, um, I always tell producers to keep an eye on body condition score. Uh, a trick I like to, to tell people is, uh, go out there with your phone and, and take a few pictures of, of cows in your herd. Um, now you've got a time-stamped photo in your in your photo library. You can come back in a, a couple weeks, uh, three weeks or a month, and, and take another picture of that that same animal uh, and compare and, and make sure that um, you know they haven't started to lose condition on us. Because I think sometimes when we see them every day, uh, we can we can kind of lose sight. Uh, of those changes over over time um and so that's that's one tip i, I like to throw out there um is, as a, a simple way to maybe keep a keep a, a record keep progress of of our um, body condition scores um and of course i i will tell you not to forget your mineral um for some you know that's always a, an area where people look to to try to cut corners sometimes and um you know, I, I get emails um, fairly regularly where where um, producers have uh, sent animals to the the diagnostic lab or sent samples to the diagnostic lab, um, and and we see a fair bit of of selenium deficiency and, and copper deficiency here in the state. Um, so making sure uh, those two minerals in particular um, that we are are feeding. Um, right amount of those and then also um that we're um, on our selenium that we're feeding uh, a blend that has got sodium selenite that's our inorganic form of selenium and then the selenium yeast uh, which is the organic form of selenium um so because keep in mind on something like selenium we can't always feed we can't feed more of it it's actually regulated by the fda how much we can put in a mineral um, so if we can't feed more of it, but we have a, a deficiency issue, we can feed a a better form of it so that for every mouthful that that animal is consuming uh, of that mineral, more of that selenium is um, getting absorbed and, and used throughout the body. Um, the other thing that I um, will put out there is um, keep an eye on, on things like vitamin A and E. Uh, it's not something I talk a whole, a whole lot about when I talk about the mineral supplement, Um but when we think about uh, drought conditions, drought stress forages uh, typically get depleted of, of things like vitamin A and E. When we think of vitamin A and E, uh, lush green forages are often a really good source of vitamin A and E. 
Um, so when we start getting into some of the really uh, inexpensive mineral supplements, sometimes those don't contain any uh, vitamin A and E in them. Um, and again, that's just a, a way where they can, where we can cut a corner. Um, but we, we certainly don't want to get into deficiencies of, of those vitamins either. Um, I have up here, these are the UK beef IRM mineral recommendations. Um, I always tell folks, this is a great starting place. Um, you can find minerals that have more of some of these minerals in there than what we've got on this sheet. Uh, you may find minerals that have different vitamin concentrations than what we have on this sheet. We actually, um, these are actually Dr. Lim Cooler and I visited about this earlier this week. Um, our, our concentrations in here may be a, a, a bit lower than what you might find in some other uh, sources. And that's a, a reflection of the fact that several years ago, we had really, really high uh, vitamin A prices due to some things happening in the vitamin A market uh, globally. Uh, and so we uh, can decrease those, but we, we've kind of left them where they're at because we haven't had a, a, a lot of concern about deficiency. So um, use this as a guideline. Um, I know several, I know many of our producers feed this exact mineral, um, but if, if that's not available to you locally, um, at least use these as a, a guideline um, it's a kind of a cheat sheet, if you will, if you're going to your feed store and, and trying to pick out a, a mineral supplement. There's a lot of information on those feed tags. Um, and so I encourage you to, to kind of use this as your cheat sheet um, and find something that, that is close to, to meeting these guidelines as, as possible. So that that's all I've got. I'll stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Van Valen. Um, I did get a question in here for you nutritionists, guys. Uh, and, and it's kind of along the same lines we were talking about back with Dr. Lim Cooler, but um, it's uh, a, a specific situation for a producer. He says, if you have a spring calving herd, should you feed hay now and have them on stockpiled fescue in the third trimester or vice versa? Hay is good quality. So as Dr. Smith went through, you know, from from the stockpiling standpoint, we've got a decline in the alkaloid levels and, and they'll continue to decline. So that's a positive. Um, the other thing to keep in the back of your mind is the forage quality will begin to decline as we see more weathering on that forage. So my recommendation is to go ahead and utilize the stockpile now, take advantage of the nutrition that is there for these cows that are in that higher stage of nutritional requirement coming off of peak lactation and, and in that breeding period. Um, that's for our fall calvers. Um, as they come down and, and you wean them in, you know, February, March, they're going to be at that dry period. Then they're going to kick out on grass and their planar nutrition will actually rebound back up. So from those fall calving perspective, I'd be on that stockpile now. And then even on your spring calvers, um, just realize that as we begin getting more freezing, frosting and more rain, that forage is going to begin to deteriorate in quality. And, and if we don't use it, as Dr. Emerald Phillips always said, if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. So um, I, I would say go ahead now. We're, we're getting mid-December. Go ahead and get on it and try to graze it off and then switch over to your higher quality hay as those spring calvers enter into that last trimester. We, I guess Dr. Van Valen and I didn't really indicate that very well, but you know, even a the protein requirement on a, a late last trimester cow is, is only about eight to 9% crude protein. And in that, uh, upper fifties on TDN. So, um, just, just bear in mind that, um, it's, it's nothing like what a lactating cow has. And I'll just add to that, Dr. Lynn Cooler, that too, as we, um, think about on those spring calving cows, I was just thinking about the energy expenditure that they they'll use later in the winter. If we get into a, a mud situation or, or have some 
some snow and some some poor quality weather conditions um that's going to increase their energy requirement as well so if they can actually kind of be out grazing that that stockpile now before they have hit lactation and potentially have that additional um environmental stress then that may also fare well fare better for them in the the long run as well mud in kentucky what are you talking about all right uh let's see we've got an okay just a thank you on that one so uh i'm going to kind of wrap things up from the the pointers and all or, or at least timely tips and and then if you have any questions still please put those in the the chat uh we usually stick around a little bit over the hour if you guys want to uh, as long as as you stick with us and have questions we'll try and get those answered but so if you have any still put them in there mine's going to be really short i just wanted to give kind of a brief update since we're talking we're since we're shooting the bull tonight i figured we needed to talk uh, a little bit about the bull so for the cape program uh this next year do expect to see a few changes um for those of you that may not have participated uh for a year or so the the one thing that that we that some folks are getting hung up on is that all bulls now have to be genomically tested and that's all breeds. There were some that were grandfathered in for a while, but all breeds uh, have to have genomically enhanced EPDs. Uh, make sure you're getting the right thing because just that he's been genomically tested does not mean that they're genomically enhanced EPDs. So work with your seed stock provider and make sure that you are getting that. Usually a good indicator is going to be the accuracy value. Uh, the easy one to look at is, say, calving ease direct. If it's in the above the 0.2 accuracy, uh, so 0.2 or above, he likely was genomically tested. If he's 0.25 or above, he qualifies regardless, but uh, that, that stipulation is in there because for most breeds, that would clearly indicate that he's been genomically tested. So it's kind of those that are in between that 0.2 and 0.25. Uh, if he falls in there, make sure that, that he does have genomically en enhanced EPDs. The other thing to expect is uh, coming into this next year, the guidelines are going to change some. Uh, I have been meeting with the Tennessee folks who has a very similar program to ours, and we are in the process of trying to uh, – merge the program, so to speak, uh, not anything to do with the money or anything, but in terms of the requirements, particularly on the EPDs, uh, so that it, it will uh, make things a little bit simpler, particular, particularly for the seed stock producers uh, that are close to that Tennessee, Kentucky line uh, that sell a lot of bulls on both sides of the line. Uh, we, we've we've had the preliminary discussions and, and we're going to try and come to uh, some agreements on, on how we can get the two programs a little bit closer together uh, and potentially uh, within two years, maybe merge them completely together. So in the first attempt, um, we, so this coming year, uh, we will make some changes that are going to move us uh, in, a, in a more common direction with the Tennessee program. So uh, expect numbers to change slightly. Uh, it won't be significantly this year uh, and then potentially a, a little bit more movement than the following year. So 25 is when we hope to have the, the two programs uh, with the same requirements. So just a little heads up on some changes that are going to be coming in the next year or two for the the cape bull program and speaking of cape uh for those of you that need to get your cape educational programming in uh, there is your code uh, so you'll need to talk to your county extension agent uh, for uh, the a and r agent in your county they're the ones that have to approve that this is an acceptable educational program and i don't know of any that have not been approving those uh, and instead of the signature from the speaker you can use this cape code and that is recognized uh, as as acceptable as an educational requirement for the CAPE program. So uh, there that is. And also want to remind everybody, as I said, we're going to be doing these sessions in January and February. So the next one up 
is January 9th, uh, and it's going to be management decisions that impact reproductive efficiency in beef herds. This is Dr. George Perry uh, from Texas A&M. Uh, Dr. Anderson has been uh, working with Dr. Perry and invited him for this talk, and I, I think it's going to be uh, it's it's going to be a great talk. It's, it's we don't we don't do a lot. It, George has done some work. If I understand less, and you might want to give him a little more information, but uh, done a lot of work on the bull side of things, and uh, and and has some really good information, uh, like on vaccinations and all. So. Um, with that, I'm going to open it back up to any questions. Uh, if anybody has anything in the chat, um, Dr. And while they're thinking of that, Dr. Anderson, you want to follow up any with Dr. Perry's talk for next go around? Yeah, George. George is one of the uh, premier uh, beef cattle reproductive scientists in the world. Uh, he does a variety of work. A lot of it is uh, extremely applied as far as estrus synchronization te techniques, uh, the biology behind improving the efficiency of those techniques. And then he's got some really cool stuff on pre-breeding vaccinations. And like you mentioned, Dr. Bullock, he's done a lot of bull work too, but uh, it's he's got a, uh, he, he truly is one of the better reproductive scientists uh, in the world, and it's our it's our pleasure to host him. He, he'll do a phenomenal job for us next next month. Good, good deal. Um, I, I, Kenny, I, if you're still on here, I uh, was uh, had a comment about call cows and and what's happening uh, with call cow prices and all. You have any info info on that? They're following everything else, and keep in mind that's one of the most seasonal markets. So they're probably off. I'm guessing something like twenty five, thirty cents a pound. The bulk of that's seasonal, though. But but they're going to follow feeders and fats down. So the same things we talked about have kind of spilled over into their markets. Um, we're, we're moving quite a few cull cows. Right, fourth quarter is when we most we move most of our cull cows when we calves. So mostly seasonal, but that that's just where it is. I, they'll be quite a bit stronger come spring, like everything else, in my opinion. All right. Uh, Dr. Smith had one more for you, too. Uh, this is a, more of one of those specific ones. I seeded in September, but with the dry weather, the grass only started growing in November. Will the seedling survive the winter? Good question, and that's the case for a number of people. What to look for is the grass seedlings. They come up just as a little, little bitty hair-like thing. Once they produce one tiller, so they've got an extra shoot coming off to the side, they typically will survive the winter. They, they've got an established root system at that point. So get out there and look and see whether you've got those tillers coming off the seedlings um, for that assurance that they'll, that they'll survive the winter. Um, a lot of us are just crossing our fingers that we won't get um, too much um, frost action. We want frost action in February to bury clover seed, but frost action now can he frost heaps some of those seedlings. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful um, that we've had enough mild weather um, that they've made it. So in the, if if they see that it does look like it's been damaged, what what do you have some specific advice what they should do? So you, you could add more grass seed in early March. Um, frost seeding grass seed is kind of a 50-50 proposition, clover does better, um, but 50-50 is better than zero, um, or you could drill some more grass seed in early March. Um, spring seeding grass seed is not as, typically not as good of a timing uh, because of the weather getting hot in the late spring, um, but, but that probably is the option, particularly if it's a new stand and you want to make sure that you have cover there would be, think about putting some more seed out um, with a drill in early March, or like I say, potentially frost seeding and taking a gamble with that. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Smith. 
I appreciate everybody joining us tonight and uh, we'll see you guys hopefully in January. Like I say, we have a special, special guest and then Dr. In, uh, then in February, we have Dr. Van Valen is going to follow that one up. So uh, stick with us and, uh, and, and we'll have another couple of good sessions. Thanks everybody. And have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you.